Okay, so now we're going to go through our functional or lower lower limb functional assessments. Um, you could do this uh, as you're doing your active range at the start um, of, the, of the process, of the uh, screening process, um, just to have a look at movements. And I love these sorts of tests because it tests lots of things at one time and you can just have a look at how someone moves and I think dynamically um, we want to really uh, assess or how they're moving dynamically because it's hugely important towards pain and dysfunction. So. First one we're going to go through is just a squat, simple squat. Um, so we're going to get PJ to squat. So if you get you to stand a little bit further forward, PJ. Yeah, sure. Okay. So again, I would just uh, instruct uh, the client. I want you to um, squat down, keeping your feet facing fairly, fairly much forwards. I like to say uh, naught to about five degrees. Okay. So we don't want those feet to be flayed, splayed out to the side. Um, and then I just want you to squat down and um, hips level with knees. So just squat yourself down. Okay. And back up again. Okay, let's do one more and back up again. So what I'd be looking at with the squat is I'd be looking at what's happening at the feet. Um, is there any excess pronation going on at either foot? I'm looking at the knees to see whether the knees drop inwards into an adducted and internally rotated position or the hip will be internally rotated if those knees are dropping in. From the side I can look at um, spine position, so can you keep the spine upright? Are the hips going down level with the knees? And what you find with a lot of people is that their heels will lift so that they've they're, um, got uh, stiffness in the ankles. Um, again, what you could do with people is put something underneath their heels and see whether that immediately makes a difference to their squat technique. Um, and from that you could say, well, okay, if we can get the ankles more mobile, then it's going to improve their squat position because all we've done is change the, uh, the length uh, of the calves and got them to squat again. Um, again, I'll be looking. I'm, some people I'll allow them to have their hands out in front as well. So again, if we did that one more time, he just just hands out in front and just squat from there. So again, a lot of people will find that easier because basically you're giving them a little bit more um, support, or the the centre of mass comes forwards a little bit because a lot of people will find to get down that low, it overbalances them backwards. So again, I'm looking at um, all those different things, how they do the movement, whether there's pain when they do the movement. So are they getting any pain or discomfort? Again, a lot of people you'll find, especially with any sort of pain or discomfort in their lower limbs, are going to squat really poorly. So it's, again, I think straight away you can look at that. Other thing is hips. So if they can't uh, get their knees out in line with their second toe, um, then you'd be looking at potentially some hip range of motion issues. So I think with the squat, the things for me that I look at um, all the time is I go on to look at ankle mobility, hip mobility, um, thoracic spine mobility, um, in order to see, okay, if they've got a poor squat, which of those things is affecting them? What about yourself, Ben? Do you look at anything else or is that...? Yeah, I love these tests. I think they're fantastic. What, what I, I like to use them at the start in the active range of motion test as well. I think um, Chris said a really good point about uh, setting them up in the right position to begin with. Make a note of that so you standardise it each time. So if they do have, have their arms in front, make a note of that each time you retest it at subsequent um, treatment sessions. Yeah. Or you can have hands across or hands on knees, but whichever way you choose, standardise that. For me, it guides, it guides the assessment then. So it just gives you tidbits and information about what you might want to look at. So as Chris was saying, ankle mobility, um, hip mobility. I generally think of it as what might be stiff and restricted and what might be weak. Yeah, so some of the common things you might see are, as you were saying, heels coming off. So ankles might be stiff, um, calves might be tight. Some of the other common things you see, if I get you to squat for me, PJ, and just lean forwards at your hips dramatically for me as, as sometimes we often see this increased forward lean so what might be stiff maybe hip flexors what might be weak posterior chain so it just gives you a general idea and you can do that with all the common movement faults that you see so I think that's a nice little mm. tip have two categories when you're looking at the squat what is stiff what is weak so if the, if the knees are flaring out maybe the muscles on the lateral aspect of the, of the hips are tight Maybe the muscles on the inside the adductors are, are weak. Yeah, so test that and it guides your assessment. Gives you a nice starting point. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I love these tests. Um, cool. So then the next one I think is really uh, valuable in the lower quadrant would be the single leg squat. So again, so if PJ, if you balance on your left leg, left. and then we're going to um, get okay. you to just do a little single leg knee bend. Um, again, so you can do this in a couple of ways. So PJ's just gone foot behind. I don't actually mind as well if people go foot in front, but again, like Glenn was saying, just make sure you standardize that so that you're, when you're repeating this test, and back up, um, repeat this test, you can um, do it in the same position so that you know whether they're improving from a movement's perspective when you look at them. Yeah. Um, so again, same with the arms as well. 
PJ's chosen to have his arms by side, no problem with that, absolutely yeah. fine. Make sure he does that. You can also standardise it, hands on hips, yeah. hands across. Just mm -hmm. keep it the same each time. Yeah, and again with this one, so if we do one more PJ, yeah, what, sure. I'm, what I'm looking at again, very similar things. So with this I'm looking at foot position. So foot position, knee position, does the knee drop inwards and back up? Um, does it go into that internal rotation position? Does the foot go into pronation? Other thing we can look at is the hips. So I'm looking at those hip levels, and that's a really important one. We're on that single leg because of glute med um, activation. So the st that standing leg that you're on, um, in order to keep your hips and keep your pelvis level as you come down, you need to have good activation of that glute med and your frontal plane stabilizers of that left hip if you're standing on the left leg. So again, if you get that drop, Straight away there's the Trendelenburg test, which is to, to look at that single leg standing and see whether there's a drop on that opposite side. And so that's one thing I think in the single leg squat that's really important to look at is just that opposite hip and see whether the uh, ASIS on that right hand side or the opposite side to the one you're standing on drops down towards the floor because of weakness of the glute med on the left. Um, so they're the major things that I would look for in a single leg squat. Yeah, you're looking at, um, as Chris was saying from the is there pronation? I think one important aspect is balance as well. Mm. So is this a result of weakness or stiffness or is this a result of poor balance? So sometimes you might want to just give them a little bit of just finger support as they do that and see if that dramatically improves it. Is it, uh, you know, have they sprained their ankle in the past and they've just got very poor proprioception on that side? Mm. Um, thoracic movements as well. Sometimes you'll see twisting in, twisting out. Yeah. Less commonly you might see them hitch their hip. More often it will drop, but you know these are all things to, yeah. to watch out for. And the same guidelines as before: what could be weak, what could be tight, yeah. And how would you test that? Which you know, in this instance, you might be wanting to look at things like Thomas tests, knee to wall tests, which we'll go through yeah, at another stage as well. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, so uh, another more dynamic test, and this one I think, um, Glenn, you've had a lot of experience with because of your work with runners. So. Um, Again, more dynamic, so for people that are getting pain when they're running or doing more dynamic activities, we've got the triple hop test. So Yeah, brilliant. So if we take you back, cautionary note here, if somebody's performing poorly on the single leg squat test, do you think we'd test the triple hop? Simple answer is no. Yeah? So if they can't control themselves properly in that in that sort of simple task, then I'm not going to add extra load onto them and potentially injure them in the, in the assessment. Yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, a little bit of a more advanced test, if you like, when your clients are, uh, are improving and they're, they're controlling their movements a little bit better. Um, for, the, for the purposes of the camera, we're going to get PJ to just do two hops, but in practice you do three. Okay, and come back and do that one more time for us. A lot of evidence with this test tying it in with increased um, cruciate ligament injuries, uh, particularly in females. And what you're looking at is that knee position. When they land, does the knee come across the midline? Simple, yeah? So you, you, it's quite good to use um, software on your iPhones and iPads to film it and to slow it down. It gives you a better uh, indication of what's going on and you can show the client and they understand it a bit more as well. The other thing I look for is noise, yeah? So are they making a lot of noise when they land? Yeah, so if they are, one nice cue is try and land a bit softer, try and make a little bit less noise. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, are they getting enough flexion in the knee? Because we want that shock absorbency in the knee when they land. You don't want them landing rigid, bang, making lots of noise and the knee coming across. Yeah, so that, that's the main things that I look mm -hmm. out for there. But a great test, just again, remember, you want to get the single leg squat working well before you do that. Yeah. I think um, where this might be relevant would be, um, I was just thinking then, in situations maybe where you had a runner who came in who got, was getting pain maybe at uh, mile, mile eight, so they ran with a, no pain for eight miles and then they started to get pain. So what you're starting to think there is maybe that it's the fatigue factor um, of repeatedly doing a slightly poor um, movement pattern. So maybe when you did the single leg squat, um, they wouldn't be too bad. Um, because again, it's more when they get fatigued that that becomes a problem. So doing a more dynamic test actually makes it the difficulty a little bit higher, makes that, that difficulty increased, and therefore you can you can see sometimes those patterns start to come out in those in that test. So I think that's just an example of where you might have someone that, that did do a single leg squat or okay, and then was not that great on the dynamic um, triple hop test. Um, okay, so the next thing we're going to do is a clock, which is another or last of our, our tests for the lower limb. Um, so for this, I'm going to get PJ to step forward slightly. 
Um, and basically what I tell my patients is they're standing on the middle of a clock face, um, they're going to balance on their, the leg that you're testing, and then you're going to do a uh, single leg mini knee bend where you're going with the other leg down to the position of the clock. So it'd be 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and then following on round. So yeah, PJ, if you do that. So just a little touch with that foot. Again, we're not stepping too much, we're just getting that little touch. And you could start to get someone to do this without touching the floor, um, as you were doing this to make it more difficult. And again, so your PJ's just going around. What I love about this one is that you get different movements of the foot. So you're getting more supination as we come across towards myself, and then you're getting more pronation as, as PJ was going across towards Glenn. This 11 o'clock movement as well, it's perfect PJ, is great. Um, because it really tests that ankle dorsiflexion. You'll find that a lot of people with um, problems will really struggle to go out into that, uh, that position uh, or at 11 o'clock with the foot. Um, and I, what I would do with this is I'd get someone to go around once on, on one side and then once on the other side and I would then compare uh, one side to the other. And again, I'm looking at um, foot, so pronation of the foot, what the knee does, um, whether there's any pain, um, comparing one side to the other in terms of balance, and I just do that once on each side. I think that's a good point about how often you'd get to do it, so you'd go through it once. With the squat and with the single leg squat, you'd want to be looking at at least five repetitions there, and I think it's vital actually, uh, we couldn't go around the different angles for the camera, but it's vital that you look at them squatting and single leg squatting from the front, from the side, and from the rear, because you'll see different things and different um, movement dysfunctions will become apparent from those angles. Yeah, so I think that's a really good point. Yeah, definitely. The other point about these tests is they translate really well into treatments. Yeah, so a lot of these tests will be your initial uh, treatment exercises for your clients. So mm. if they're moving poorly on a squat, you'll educate them on how, how they're moving, get a mirror in front of them, give them some exercises to um, you know, assist in improving their movement pattern mm. and start them off with that as their exercise. They can tally it to what they see, what they feel, makes the compliance a lot better as well. Mm. Yeah. I think another good point with that is that what you can do with a lot of these tests is video them. So on your iPhone or on, on any sort of video software that you've got, um, what's really nice about that is that when they've, you know, when you've gone through the treatment process or as you go along, you can constantly re reassess that. You've got a lovely uh, objective marker then that you can show the patient as to say, here's where you were before with your squat. This is what you were doing before. Now this is what you're doing now. And I think that again brings about a lot of compliance. And um, it just means, and again, it's a really good objective marker to show that their movement patterns are improving. Definitely. Compliance is key. I mean, the exercises that we give only work if they do them, right? Mm. So if, yeah. if in order for them to do them uh, at the amount that we set, the amount we prescribe, they want to see the value in it and mm. the use and what the end goal is. So Absolutely. Yeah, the, the uh, filming is, is fantastic for that. Yeah. Great. So those are our four functional assessments for the lower quadrant.